Well, Happy New Year's to everybody. New Year's is a wonderful time for me because it's a time both that we re reflect, we look back at to this past year, then we look forward into the coming year. It's a time really set aside where we can zoom out and we can ask, what are we doing? Uh, last week, John did a great job summarizing the highlights of 2020, uh, the many, 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 many highlights of 2020. Uh, but today, what we're going to do is take a time to really look forward. Because you see, as we're navigating 2020 with all the different crises and all the different upheavals going on, it's so easy to allow that to consume our vision, to consume everything that we see and that we think about and that we feel. And we forget God has something bigger going on. We forget God still has a calling on our life. God has purpose for our lives. You see, one of the big struggles over this past year is that as we navigate each different crisis, we forget our purpose. And when we lose our purpose, that's when we lose our joy. That's when we lose our peace. That's when we lose our satisfaction with life. You see, purpose is an amazing thing. If we hold on to our purpose, if we hold on to our callings, then no matter what comes, we have peace. We have joy because we know we're walking with God. We're walking in the way God has shown us. And purpose is not just something that we seek within the church. Purpose is something that everybody seeks and just looks a little bit different. You see, when a college student asks, what should I study? What should I major in? They're looking for purpose. When a mom asks, should I be a working mom or should I stay home for a little bit with my kid when they're growing up? She's asking for purpose. When someone retires, and we've all known someone that's been retired for about five minutes because they're looking for purpose. They ask this question, well, what do I do now? They're looking for purpose, and that's something that we want to seek. And not only purpose as individuals, each and every one of us, we have purpose within this life, but us as a church. What is Centerpoint's purpose? Not only the church universal, but this one in particular. When I say this church, I don't mean this building or this organization. I mean this people. This people gathered here. This people gathered with us online. What is our purpose? What are we going to be about in the coming year? And so today, I want to address that. I want to take a moment. I really want to invite you into a conversation that the pastors have been having for a long while seeking our purpose and seeking ways to communicate that and shape it and mold it in those ways. You know, a couple of months ago, we got away. We did a little overnight retreat um, right outside the city, got away for a little bit. And I asked a very simple question because we we're looking for our purpose. And the way you discover that is first to kind of see who you are. And it gives you direction as to where you're going. But the question that I asked to start off our time together was this. Do you remember your first Sunday at Center Point? And I said, tell me about it. So I want to ask you this morning, does anybody remember their first Sunday? Now, if today's your first Sunday, that's easy to remember. So that, I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad you can remember it. But some of y'all have been here longer than I have. Can anybody remember their first Sunday? What do you remember about your first time here? Somebody give me something to work with. In the church, center point. It's been a minute, hasn't it? What do you remember? Mike, what do you remember? Warmly welcomed. What else? Worship. Anybody else remember anything? Little Hannah, I'm repeating so everybody can hear. Little Hannah welcoming everybody, running around like crazy. Anybody else remember anything from their first Sunday? The preaching, sitting at a small table. What about everybody online? What do you remember from your first Sunday? <laughs> that was a great one. Good job. What I remember is this. I came in. Now, my family wasn't with me. I think my wife may have had kids visiting grandma or something. I don't remember. But I remember, because it's been a while. I remember I was there by myself, been invited a few times. Um, actually, a friend of mine who led me to the Lord uh, invited me to come to church. And so wanted to come and check it out. And... 
I didn't, didn't know anybody, didn't know anything, so I just sat down. Yeah, I don't know what to do. And sat down next to a person. And we just kind of struck up a conversation. I said, well, this is my first time here. I'm just trying to check things out. She says, oh, that's nice. And, and so I didn't really know what to say. So I asked, well, have you, know, have you been coming here long? Or is it your first time too? And she says, well, I've been coming here for a little while. It turned out that was Sally Phillips. That was our <laughs> pastor's wife um, at the time. And so she'd been there for a little while is what she told me. But yeah, but I remember that. And when I talked with John and when I talked with Ken, what they remembered from their first Sundays was the people. I noticed nobody remembered what the sermon was about. Nobody remembered what songs we played. We remember worship. We remember the feeling. But nobody remembered the songs that we played. And those things are vitally important. I'm all about preaching. I'm all about music. I'm all about all of that. But what we remembered was how we felt. We remembered the people that welcomed us and that called us together. We remembered walking into their purpose and their calling as a church. And so today, I want us to just take some time and explore some of that. And what's interesting, we're not the first people to ask about purpose. People all through time have asked, what is my purpose? What am I here for? You see, Adam and Eve, they asked that question. What am I here for? As they took that forbidden fruit and tried to discover their purpose. And a little while later, Moses asked the question, what am I here for? As God was telling him to go back into Egypt and to lead the Israelites out of slavery. A little while later, Gideon asks, what am I here for? As God is calling him up to deliver Israel once again from captivity. The prophets asked the question, what am I here for? As God called them and they said, go to my people and tell them to turn back to me. The Israelites, when they were in exile, when they lived in a foreign land for many, many years, many of whom didn't, didn't come back, they asked, what am I here for? As they lived far away from the temple and far away from where they knew God. All through, it's called, after the Old Testament was finished, it's called the intertestamental period. As Israel changed one tyrant to another, to another, to another, and eventually ended up with the Roman occupiers. To where every morning when they would get up and look out their window, they see a Roman soldier walking down the street. Just to remind them who was in charge. They asked, what am I here for? And one day, people gathered around Jesus, and they asked him, what am I here for? You see, Jesus was one that came upon this scene, this scene to where the Romans, they held all civil authority. They could do anything they wanted. They taxed the people. They bribed the people. They extorted from the people. They abused the people. And then within that, there was this group of religious leaders, and they held sway over the Israelites. And they used all kinds of strong-arm tactics just to keep people in line. Anything from shunning them, from kicking them out of the temple, to charging them their own taxes. They did all kinds of things just to keep people in line because their thought was, well, if only we could live perfectly, then we'd be free from Rome. Then God would deliver us yet again. And Jesus comes on the scene and he says, you're missing it. He says, that's not your purpose. Let me show you your purpose. If you have your Bible, open them up. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 22 this morning. And the passages will be on the screen here in just a moment as well. But here, these religious leaders that felt all kinds of threatened by Jesus, because Jesus was challenging their authority, they come and they're trying to test Jesus. They're trying to catch him in his own words. Have you ever had somebody come up to you and ask you a question? They're not really interested in your answer. They're just trying to wait for you to talk so they can interrupt you or so that they can prove you wrong or something like that. Anybody ever experienced that? Just about every day, yeah. Well, Jesus experienced that too. And this is what it looked like. There's these two groups, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They came together. And in chapter 22 of Matthew... Verse 34, we see this. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, there was one group that tried to test Jesus, and it didn't get really far. The Pharisees got together and said, well, we'll get them. And one of them, an expert in the law, tested Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, 
Love the Lord your God <clears throat> with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. You see, it was common practice for the people to ask the teachers and ask the rabbis, which are the big laws? There's over 600 laws that they were called to follow. And some of them, they divided really into two different categories, into weighty laws and light laws. Now, that doesn't mean ones were less important than the others, but it was just a realization that the law against murder, it was weighty in the sense of the law against wearing clothes with two different fabrics in them, was not. Some laws were just simply weightier than others. And so they come to Jesus. What's the greatest commandment? What am I here for? What am I called to do? And Jesus responds simply, love God. Love God is the first and the greatest. If all we do in this life is love God, that would have been a good life right there. Another way to phrase that is through worship, living a life of worship, a lifestyle <clears throat> of worship. Now, what Jesus is quoting here, he's quoting something called the Shema, this Old Testament law that the Jews would recite twice a day. And Jesus is telling them, that what you recite, love the Lord your God, that's the command. So what's our purpose here in 2021, church? What are we going to be about as a church, not only as people, but together. Well, as center point, we're going to love God. We're going to do all we can to love God. Our purpose, it's found in love. It's found in loving God. You know, when I mention that people search all over for purpose, if they don't look for it within God, they miss it. Because you see that college student, he might rack up all kinds of degrees and have all kinds of knowledge. But if it stops there, he missed it. And that parent, they might find their purpose in raising kids. And so they spend all their time with their kids and they teach their kids all that they can do. But then one day, Lord willing, those kids are going to move out. And if they were your purpose, what happens when they go? Purpose is something that we seek, and we seek it. We have to seek it within God. Otherwise, we won't find it. Some folks try to find purpose, really, in their bank account. They work all day and sacrifice so much to expand the business. And then one day, they look up and they find that they have enough for 10 lifetimes. But if that's where they stop, they've missed it. We... We will be about the business of a loving God. Now, what does that look like? It looks like times of worship. It looks like our Sunday morning times together. It looks like regular nights of worship. Aaron and I are talking about that, trying to get some scheduled, perhaps every month or so, getting together just for a time of worship, like a Friday night deal or something like that. But it looks like focusing our hearts and our mind and our attention on God. And not only through music, it means we're going to teach into loving God. What we teach and what we preach, it's all going to be about how can we love God? How do we respond to God? What do we do with this love of God that we have? We want to be about loving God, but it doesn't stop there. You see, to truly love God, it leads us somewhere. To truly love God, we love what he loves. And do you know what God loves more than anything? people. We love God. We love people. Jesus, he continues. He makes it explicit. He just said, love God. This is the first and greatest commandment. Verse 39, he says this, and the second is like it. You know, they came up to Jesus and said, what's the greatest commandment? Singular. And Jesus gives him one. And he says, oh, I got one more for you. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus is saying the entire word of God, everything that we know about God is summarized by love God, love people. And it has to be. Now, when we love God and we let it overflow into our love of people, that changes the way we interact really with everything. 
that person that's seeking knowledge, that's seeking all the college degrees, when they love God, they can use that to try to find ways to learn more about God, to teach people about God, to alleviate suffering in God's world, to bring blessing to people. That's an extension of loving God. When parents truly love God and they see their children not as their purpose, but they see their purpose as parents, is to show their children how to love God, then it becomes more than just trying to make it through each day. It becomes, how can I show Jesus to my child today? That business person that loves God and loves people, yeah, they're going to work hard and they're going to earn a profit, and then they're going to seek, how can I use this money to bless God's people, to sow it and to invest it in the kingdom for mighty, mighty works? And so we love God. Now, Jesus says, and love your neighbor as yourself. Again, he's quoting the Old Testament. But then there's often this question, well, who is my neighbor? You see, when we think of loving our neighbor, we tend to think of the people that are far away, that are distant from us, and God wants us to love them, and that's true. Or we think about the people at work. God wants me to love my coworker. That's true. What if God also means the person that lives like 100 feet away from you on the other side of that fence or across the hall in the other apartment? You know, the one that drives you nuts, plays music too loud, that got cars all through the street, blocks your way into your driveway. You know the one I'm talking about. Their kids leave their toys out all the time. Some of it ends up in your yard. Their dog walks through your yard and leaves presents for you. What if God is, what if Jesus is calling us to love them as well? Or what if, what about the ones that we may rightly decide, that's my enemy. That's someone who's opposed to me. That's someone who is hostile to everything that I stand for. What does Jesus want us to do with them? Well, a little bit earlier, Jesus said this. He said, you have heard that it was said, and love your neighbor. There it is again. And hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. That you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So the ones that you feel that are so opposed to you, and maybe they are, what is Jesus calling us to do with them? Love them. Love them. Show them Christ. Show them Jesus. And then Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Too often when we think of be perfect, we think of following our own checklist, our own set of rules, and the way that we want to live out this Christian life. That's what we want to do to be perfect. But if we focus on that, we're going to mess up. Jesus says, perfection comes from who we are and how we love. Do we love like God does? That is how we can achieve this perfection that Jesus calls us to. And so as a church, what are we going to do in 2021? We're going to love God. And we're going to love people. Now, what does this look like? Well, the most common example is a small group. If you're in a small group, you know what I mean. It's a time set aside to invest in each other and to get to know people better at a level that we just can't do here on Sunday mornings. It's a time to get together, many times share a meal, share a teaching, just share life together. And the more we press in and get to know people, that's how we can love them. It's really hard to love people that we know nothing about. And so we get involved in small groups. We get involved in discipleship. It's just a fancy way of saying meeting together with either one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two or something like that and talking about Jesus, doing a Bible study, doing projects together just to show our love for people. It talks about once this weather gets nicer, about doing outdoor events and outreach events and doing Sunday lunches and all kinds of stuff. Those are things that, Lord willing, we want to do. We want to be about. We've got this beautiful property. We've got these beautiful picnic tables out there. I don't know if you've seen them or not. But we want to put them to use and interact with this neighborhood around us. 
We want to do all we can to love people because God loves them. So what are we going to be about? We're going to love God and we're going to love people. Now, if we get that far to where we're loving God and we're loving people, what do we do with this love? You see, in the biblical world, in the time when Jesus lived, you could not separate love from action. But somehow over the years and over the centuries, that separation has come in. It's where you get guys that say, well, I love my family. I'd do anything for them. I just won't spend any time with them. Love must come with action. And so we love God, we love people, and then we live it out. You see, in the Great Commission, which is what many people are familiar with, this is where Jesus gave really the purpose statement to the church. He says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, Jesus gives this simple command. He says, make disciples. What's a disciple? A disciple is someone who loves God and loves people. And then Jesus says, go and make more of those. That means teach people how to love God and love people. And it's interesting. When he says here, he says, teach them to obey all I've commanded you. Jesus' teaching, it's always action-oriented. Have you noticed that? Jesus wasn't really interested in knowledge for knowledge's sake just so he could know more. But Jesus was interested in teaching so that it would change lives. It would change people not only within their hearts, but it would change what they do. Often we hear about this connection between our head and our hearts, and I add one to it. What we know in our head must change our hearts so that it changes what we do with our hands. We love God, we love people, and we live it out. We do something with it. That means we're going to bless our city. A couple months ago, we went through bless. What does it mean? If you recall, it's begin with prayer. It's listen. It's eat together. It's serve people. It's share our stories of how Jesus has forever changed us and forever changed who we are. And so we bless our city. We bless our neighborhoods and our communities and our schools and our families. It means that we minister, that we discover our spiritual gifts, a few months ago, this past fall, we got to do a spiritual gifts course right in the middle of the week. So much fun discovering how our passions and our personalities and our giftings all intersect together to reveal to us what might God have for me on an individual level. We want to discover those, and then we want to act them out. And that might be at church. It might be outside of church. You know, through these ministries that we partner with through the Christmas offering— we're able to help people connect to their passions. When I meet with folks that have a passion for the homeless ministry, it's so good for me to be able to say, check out Darren Morton over on Turning Point at Wilkes Boulevard. They have a wonderful ministry caring for the homeless population here in town. They do a phenomenal job. And several of you have already connected with them. That's what it means to love God, love people, and to live it out. And it's also... This also shows us really a discipleship process, meaning someone comes to Christ. When you came to Christ for the first time, and then you say, well, what do I do now? Well, the first step is to grow in our love for God. We're going to focus on loving God. We're going to read about loving God. We're going to pray. We're going to sing. We're going to worship all of these things so that we might grow in our love from God. And then as we grow in that love, the second stage, second step, we begin to love people. We get involved in each other's lives. We learn more about people. We realize that there's no such thing as a boring person because God is doing something extraordinary in the life of every single person you've ever met. And so we want to love people by getting to know that. And then we begin to live out that love. We begin to do something with it. Love God, love people, live it out. This is what we are about, church. This is what Sensor Point is about. This is what God has called each of us to be about, not only individually, but together as a church. This is the vision for the new year. And Lord willing, we'll be able to do that.
Worship band, why don't you come back up here? What I want to do now is I want to take a moment with the new year, with the new beginnings that we're thinking about right now. And I just want to take a moment and bless you. Bless the church. This people. And I'm so honored and so grateful that I get to pastor. And get to be a part of your lives. You know, because of my calling, because of what I do, I get to be involved in people's lives at the highest moments and at the lowest moments. And it's a great gift. It's a great honor. I want to bless you because I want you to know how much we as pastors, we as the leaders, we think about you, church. We pray for you all the time. Always wondering about what's going on in your life. I want to pray a blessing over you because I don't know if it's okay for pastors to feel pride or not, but we're proud of this church. We're proud of you. You know, over this past year, there's been so many things that have tried to pull people apart, that have tried to pull society apart, but yet you're doing all you can to unite together. And we unite around Jesus. We don't unite around political parties. We don't unite around hobbies. We don't unite around neighborhoods. We unite around Jesus. So I want you to ask you to do this. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and send them down. I'm going to ask you to stand. If you're at home, I want you to stand as well. I want you to stand. I want you to close your eyes. And just simply receive this. And then we'll close out in worship. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. I pray that you would walk in joy in 2021. I pray that you would walk with God's vision and see our world through his eyes. May God restore to you today the joy that you may have lost this past year. May God remind you constantly of his presence that he would never leave you and never forsake you. And may God's love for you completely overwhelm you, O church, so that even if you tried to miss it, you wouldn't be able to. May God lift up, lift up yourself when you feel low, May God lead you beside the steel waters and through the green pastures. May God show you over and over again that He desires simply, simply to be your friend. All those things that come to mind when you think, why would God want to be my friend? Doesn't He know I'm this, that, and the other? God knows all that stuff. And He's done away with it. May God give you healing in this year. May God give you peace in this year. May God give you deliverance, give you salvation in this year. May God give you his hand this year and walk with you as we walk through this life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.